Chapter 3 of The Adventures of Poor Mrs. Quack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Poor Mrs. Quack by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 3 Mrs. Quack tells about her home. It's a long story, said Mrs. Quack, shaking the tears from her eyes, and I hardly know where to begin. Begin at the beginning, said Jerry Muskrat. Your home is somewhere way up in the Northland where the honker goose lives, isn't it? Mrs. Quack nodded. I wished I were there this very minute, she replied, the tears coming again, but sometimes I doubt if ever I'll get there again. You folks who don't have to leave your homes every year don't know how well off you are or how much you have to be thankful for. I never could understand what people want to leave their homes for anyway, declared Peter. We don't leave because we want to, but because we have to, replied Mrs. Quack, and we go back just as soon as we can. What would you do if you couldn't find a single thing to eat? I guess I'd starve, replied Peter simply. I guess you would, and that is just what we would do if we didn't take the long journey south when Jack Frost freezes everything tight there where my home is, returned Mrs. Quack. He comes earlier up there and stays twice as long as he does here and makes ten times as much ice and snow. We get most of our food in the water or in the mud under the water, as of course you know, and when the water is frozen, there isn't a scrap of anything we can get to eat. We just have to come south. It isn't because we want to. It's because we must. There is nothing else for us to do that I don't see what you want to make your home in such a far place for said practical Peter. I should think you would make it where you can live all year round. I was born up there, and I love it, just as you love the dear old briar patch, replied Mrs. Quack simply. It's home, and there's no place like home. Besides, it is very beautiful and very wonderful place in the summer. There is everything that ducks and geese love. We have all we want of the food we love best, Everywhere is shallow water with tall grass growing in it. Whom interrupted Peter. I wouldn't think much of a place like that. That's because you don't know what good is, snapped, snapped Jerry Muskrat. It would suit me, he added with shiny eyes. There are the dearest little islands just made for safe nesting places, continued Mrs. Quack, without heeding the interruptions. And the days are long, and it is easy to hide, and there is nothing to fear, for two-legged creatures with terrible guns never come there. If there is nothing to fear, why do you care about places to hide? demanded Peter. Well, of course, we have enemies, just as you do here, but they are natural enemies. Foxes and minks and hawks and owls, explained Mrs. Quack. Of course, we have to watch out for them and have places where we can hide from them, but it is our wits against their wits, and it is our own fault if we get caught. That is perfectly fair, so we don't mind that. It is only men who are not fair. They don't know what fairness is. Peter nodded that he understood, and Mrs. Quack went on. Last summer... Mr. Quack and I had a nest on the dearest little island, and no one found it. First we had twelve eggs, and then twelve of the dearest babies you ever saw. Maybe, said Peter doubtfully, thinking of his own babies. They grew so fast that by the time the cold weather came, they were as big as their father and mother, continued Mrs. Quack, and they were smart, too. They had learned how to take care of themselves just as well as I could. 
I certainly was proud of that family. But now I don't know where one of them is. Mrs. Quack suddenly choked up with grief, and Peter politely turned his head away. End of chapter 3